Hello, my name is Chuck Elliott, uh, and this is the NC Bold session called Classroom Protocols with a Technology Twist. Uh, if you want to, you can scan that QR code that's on the screen to access these slides, or you can use the bit.ly under my name there. Um, that is case sensitive, so it is all lowercase once you type it in. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, First off, a little bit about me. Uh, as I said, my name is Chuck Elliott. Uh, that picture in the upper right-hand corner there uh, was taken in Philadelphia. We had the opportunity the last time uh, ISTE was in person uh, to go to Philadelphia. That's the tech team as it was at that point in time. Uh, a couple of them have moved on, but um, glad to have this photo of everybody that's in there. So. Uh, I am an instructional technology facilitator for Franklin County Schools. If you don't know where that is, uh, we are the county that is directly east of Wake County. Uh, a little bit of professional information about me. I've worked in education for 19 years. Uh, I have a master's degree in digital teaching and learning from North Carolina State University. Uh, a couple personal notes. Uh, I'm married with two kids. Uh, one boy, one girl, and it'll be 20 years uh, in December. Um, I also enjoy reading and watching crime dramas, and I'm also an avid sports fan. Um, mostly the uh, Cleveland area teams, but not all the Ohio teams. So, um, we'll go ahead and get going. So, just to review our session goals for today, and hopefully we meet all of those goals. Uh, first off, uh, get to know a little bit about each other. So you got to know a little bit about me. Uh, I'm going to introduce and refresh the idea of classroom protocols. If you've never heard of those before, we'll go through those. Uh, we'll also go through and share some classroom protocols and how we can add a tech twist to those. And finally, uh, Hopefully we'll have an opportunity or you'll have an opportunity to create some activities using these classroom protocols with the tech twists. So first off, um, let's go through what are classroom protocols, right? So we may have heard that term before, but maybe not really know what it means. Uh, I do know that edu protocols is a big buzzword nowadays. Um, so what are protocols? So when we talk about classroom protocols, we are referring to activities that are structured. We also want to make sure that they are procedurally based, right? So we have processes in place that students follow. There's a targeted academic reason applied to a protocol, right? It's not just for whatever. There is an academic reason for why we're doing that activity. And finally, uh, you should be able to use it in multiple ways or for multiple um, topics, ideas, or concepts that you're using in class. So the idea behind a protocol, if all of these are in place, you can simply say we're using protocol blank today and the students would know because they've used it before and they know the steps, the process, and everything else that's involved. So um, the strategies that we're going to be talking about today uh, are based off of the resource uh, that you see here in front of you. Uh, this has gone through a couple ideations. Um, I believe it started out as like 85 um, classroom strategies, then went to 180 something, and now they're up to 335. Uh, so um, this uh, image that you see in front of you is linked to the page to make sure I give proper credit uh, or credit to do, as well as the title of the slide is also linked to go ahead and access these resources. So you can go back through and look and see what other uh, protocols that are there. Um, so you're not just limited to the ones that we're going to discuss today. You also have an opportunity on that website, if you click on this link here, uh, to go ahead and get a PDF version of what's called the Not-So-Little Itty-Bitty Book of Classroom Protocols. So it has everything that you would see on the website as well, but it's just in a PDF form kind of broken down, um, and it has some of the indices and everything else that are involved. So you can look at it either way. 
Um, but I just want to make sure I gave credit where credit's due. The classroom protocols that I will be discussing are coming from these uh, two resources. So the first one falls under reading protocols, and it is called Fishbowl. Uh, I have done this several times within my classrooms uh, with students, so uh, perhaps you have as well. So we'll just go ahead and go through the basics of the process of a Fishbowl. So to start, uh, you would want to create uh, specific targeted questions around a topic or idea uh, that you want your students to discuss or dig a little bit deeper into. So once you have those created, what you would do is you would hand those out to the students. The students would then review those questions or those topics. Um, there might be a couple more resources involved where they may have to read, you know, a couple articles or whatever it is. But again, right, they would have that information ahead of time. Then what you would do is you would divide the students into two groups. The first one is the inner circle. That's your discussion group. The second group is your outer circle, which is the observation group. So the inner circle, as you see here in the image, um, is going to participate in the discussion about the question. So you'll have an allotted time for that inner circle. Um, they will go through. One key thing to remember um, is to make sure that you have um, standards set in place for how this conversation goes, right? We don't want to be rude to people. We don't want to be cutting, we're not cutting people off. Um, we're not going to be offensive or um, take jabs at people when we're having a discussion. So proper discussion etiquette may need to be discussed ahead of time and then just reiterate it as you go through. But that inner circle will discuss the question while the outer circle then is listening and recording um, what they hear um, the inner circle say. So the idea of recording this information and keeping track of it is so that it could possibly use for a whole group discussion later, or maybe you want students to reflect individually later. Whatever it is, uh, definitely making sure that they listen and record to what's going on within the inner circle. So what you would do after that discussion is completed you know, depending on the time that you would allot, whatever it may be, you would then have those circles switch positions. So your outer circle would become the inner circle, inner circle would become outer. Uh, not only would they switch physical position, but you would also have them switch their roles and tasks, right? So those that were discussing in the first half would then be listening and recording in the second half. Those that were listening and recording in the first half would then be part of the discussion uh, within the inner circle. So again, you would let that process take place. Once you've completed that and everybody has had an opportunity to uh, record and listen or and be a fish, uh, you would then allow students to then turn uh, to one another from the inner circle to the outer circle and have a discussion again. Again, this, um, you know, if you don't feel like having this as part of it, you don't have to. Uh, but again, this kind of gets uh, those individuals that may not have had an opportunity to talk or discuss with each other to have an opportunity to do that. Um, so then you would have those individuals talk. And then finally, uh, you would bring the whole class together and conduct a whole class discussion, uh, bringing up any key points, major ideas, ooh, aha moments, oh, I didn't think of that whatever it may be, so that everybody kind of gets that understanding uh, from what happened in those discussions that took place. So when we talk about putting a technology twist on Fishbowl, um, probably the most straightforward way to do that would be to create and use uh, online discussion boards. So uh, we'll look at some tools once I go through this technology twist, uh, if you're not familiar with any of those. So, uh, essentially, what you would do is you want to create an online discussion board about that central topic or including those questions. You would divide those students into groups and then assign them those different questions to discuss. You would then have to make sure that you knew which students were going to be uh, were going to serve as the fish for that one question, and then the other group would be observers, and then vice versa for the other questions that they're answering. All right, so that everybody kind of takes on each of those roles. So once all those questions and discussions have been completed, you could then have those students respond to a separate discussion board 
which would serve as your whole group discussion, right? Uh, and so for this one, you would have those students again, reflect on any main ideas or aha moments or questions that they may still have about those smaller discussions that took place, right? Um, and for me, one benefit of utilizing um, an online discussion board, right, is that it kind of allows those individuals who may not be willing or ready to speak out in front of the whole group uh, the opportunity to still express his or her opinions about um, what was read or the questions that were there uh, and not having to, you know, put it out in front of everybody and stand up in front of everybody in the class. So you do get that kind of benefit here uh, from the technology twist. So if you're not familiar or you're not sure where to start as far as online discussion tools, uh, one, you know, I've got a handful up here. Uh, these are just five, um, you know, that I put on here. There may be some other ones out there, some that you have used. Uh, but Canvas has a discussions built into uh, all of their courses. So you can simply use those uh, within your classes. Uh, Google Classroom, you could ask a question within there. You could also use the stream as a place to uh, conduct a discussion within your classroom, uh, within Google Classroom. Um, Flipgrid uh, is another great tool. Uh, this one's pretty neat because it allows the students to record themselves um, if that's something that they want to do. If they're not really fond of recording themselves talking, they could still use Flipgrid, but just share your screen uh, with whatever is up there and say what you want to say rather than have a video of yourself up there. Uh, Padlet is a tried and true uh, discussion tool. Again, um, you know, you can have the students sign in, put their names up there, add to it, uh, add comments, add pad, um, add the little notes to the different um, comments that are put up there. So again, Padlet, a great tool to use for that as well. Uh, now comment is another one. Uh, it allows the teachers to put a question up there and then allow individuals to respond and comment uh, and go back and forth with those responses. So uh, again, just a handful of discussion tools, um, but you know, feel free when we get to the end uh, to go ahead and come back to this slide, click on any of those and it will take you to um, those resources. Uh, up next, we're going to look at collaboration protocols, and within collaboration protocols, we're going to look at one uh, specific strategy that's called collaboration stations. So with collaboration stations, um, you would have throughout the classroom um, multiple spots where you would have either envelopes or folders, depending on what you have, doesn't matter either way. Uh, and within those envelopes or folders, you would have one copy of a set of questions or a topic or um, one main question that they would have to respond to, whatever it is, um, within there, right? And it would need to be assigned to that group, right? So that individual group would need it. Um, and you can have, uh, you can put numbers at the top if you want. Um, you can you know, choose a group leader and the group leader's names at the top, whatever it is. Uh, but you definitely want to make sure that you have it. Um, identified for that group. So then what the students would do within those small groups uh, is that they would move between these stations working together to answer those questions. Uh, and then they would answer those questions on the sheets of paper that they have. Before moving to the next uh, station, they would then uh, have somebody take their response up to wherever it needs to be handed in, wherever their stack is or their pile is up front. Um, and that's kind of important for uh, how we're going to finish it off, making sure that we have those uh, responses kept in one place. They would then continue this process moving through each station, uh, answering questions, handing in the responses, so on and so forth. Uh, until they've gone through all the stations uh, and time is completed for the activity. So once everybody's handed in all their sheets, what you would do is you would then hand out the group's responses to another group, right? So one would go to four, two would go to three, three would go to so on and so forth. Um, and then you would have those um, individuals score those or mark those responses. And again, you as a teacher would have the final say on any questions or concerns that may come about with students trying to say, well, that's not complete or that's incorrect. And the other group saying, well, no, that is correct. You would then be, you know, you'd have the final say. Uh, finally, um, 
everybody loves a little bit of competition. So you may want to go ahead and total all those correct answers to determine a winner. You can do it by overall winner, or if you had um, um, a certain amount of questions per station, um, you could do it by the winner of each station uh, and go from there. But like I said, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of healthy competition. So how can we put a technology twist on collaboration stations? One of the most straightforward ways to do that would be to use QR codes, right? So uh, rather than having to create the envelopes and making copies of the paperwork and all that kind of stuff, you could simply have a document or a resource um, connected to a QR code, right? Uh, it doesn't have to be anything uh, very extravagant. It could be an image, right? And then that image you would want the students to respond to what they see in that image, what they notice. Um, but, you know, creating those QR codes, uh, pretty much any and every device that's out there nowadays should have some type of QR code reading capability. Uh, so you just have those set up throughout the classroom. Uh, if you are not sure where to begin, uh, first place, if you're on a Windows machine and you have Chrome open, there is a share icon in the URL, the Omnibar. Uh, and it, what you can do is you can click on that and it should give you a QR code option to create a QR code for whatever page or screen you're on. Uh, if you are not on a Windows machine, you can always use, uh, there are multiple resources out there, but I have just included one in here called Unitag. So you can use Unitag to go ahead and create your uh, QR codes, print those out, and have those uh, at different locations throughout the classroom. And for uh, this example, we're going to go ahead and we're going to have Google Forms um, as what's connected to those QR codes. So you'd have a Google Form with a couple questions or you know whatever it is on it. Students in their small groups would respond um, to that um, that Google form, or you'd only need one at that point in time, they would submit it, move on to the next station, and continue on with this process of submitting the responses to those Google forms until they've gone through all of the stations. The nice thing about Google forms is that it collects all of the responses in a spreadsheet, which could then easily be shared with different groups, right, for that scoring aspect that we saw in the original version of Collaboration Stations. You can then share those sheets. Those sheets would then be able to be scored by the different groups, and uh, you could determine your winners, again, whether you wanted to go by station or overall uh, based on those responses. So that's how you can take a technology twist to the collaboration station strategy. And finally, we're going to look at feedback protocols. So uh, within feedback protocols, we're going to look at one that's called a 321. So the 321 protocol um, is probably one that most people are familiar with, um, but we're going to go ahead and go through it and then talk about how we can put a technology twist on it. So the process is when you're telling students, all right, we're going to complete the 321 protocol, you would then have students get out a sheet of paper. They'd fold the sheet of paper in half, tear it uh, into two pieces. You could either have the students share with another student at that point in time, uh, or they could save that other half for uh, the next time you do the 321 protocol. So then you would ask, for example, right, this is what they have. Uh, on the Edumentality website, right? For example, you could have them write down three things they learned, two things they were interested in or noteworthy, and one question that they still have. Again, you could take any type of variation uh, to this that you wanted, three things I enjoyed, two things I didn't enjoy, one thing that I still have concerns about, whatever it may be, uh, and then having students answer those questions on the sheet of paper and hand it in, right? It's a nice quick hitter for the protocol to kind of get that feedback and information from students. Um, great ways to use this, right? Could be used as an exit ticket. Could be used as a warm-up, right? Based off of what was discussed yesterday or if you had assigned homework or an, or an activity, you could have the students come in the very next day and respond to some questions in the 321 protocol as part of their warm-up. You could also include the 321 protocol within the middle of a lesson, right? A middle lesson check 
Uh, some people may refer to those as a temperature check to see where students are uh, as far as their understanding of that topic. So uh, could be used in any of those ways, could be used in all of those ways if you think about it for um, one individual lesson. So how can we go ahead and put a technology twist on the 321 protocol? Uh, by very simply using any type of digital polling program that is out there, right? Uh, you can have that within your lesson that you're going through. Students simply click on a link. Uh, it could be within uh, the Google Slides that they're using or the presentation that you're using. Uh, the questions there, they submit it. Uh, you get that immediate feedback. You can see right then and there where students are, right? Uh, so one big benefit of this is that you get that immediate feedback instead of having to maybe go through those sheets of paper and tally everything. Um, so some polling tools that you can use. Uh, poll Everywhere is a great one. Uh, you could use Poll Everywhere within Google Slides. It incorporates uh, very easily within there. Uh, Mentimeter uh, is another great one that works within Google Slides. Um, you know, there's um, different features, different types of questions that you can ask within Mentimeter. That's pretty nice. Then you've got Canvas Quizzes or Google Forms, uh, depending on what you're using and how you want to use it. Uh, Canvas Quizzes is pretty nice because there is a survey option, right? If you're not looking to necessarily grade anything, but you want that information, you could just set it up as a survey where students could uh, respond to those questions um, within it, right? You can have it within the module, you can have it linked within a module, whatever it may be. Uh, Google Forms, again, right? You know, you can have that linked, you can have it embedded somewhere, whatever the case is. Uh, students are, yeah, students could quickly click on that, go to that form, answer that question. Uh, quizzes, again, uh, a great uh, tool if you're looking to even add a little bit of gamification, but again, very easy tool to use to get quick information uh, for students. And then finally, Pear Deck. Um, again, this works really well within Google Slides. There are uh, multiple different ways that students can answer questions within there. Uh, I believe there's a drawing feature that's part of it. Uh, so again, you know, any of these tools are great ones to look at using um, if you're wanting to incorporate the 321 protocol and collect that information uh, from students quickly and get that feedback pretty quickly. So uh, now it is your turn. Uh, so what I'd like you to go ahead and do is you can go ahead and do a couple things. You can go back to any of the protocols that we've discussed uh, and go through and look at how you can create um, some type of um, protocol from that using those tools that I shared with you that you could use then within your classroom um, either tomorrow, next week, uh, next school year, whatever it may be. Uh, you could also go through uh, that website and look at any of the protocols that are there uh, and maybe um, you know think about ways you can use those within your classroom based on that. Um, but, you know, either of those uh, options are available to you, so you can go ahead and utilize that time uh, to work on that. Uh, finally, I definitely want to make sure I give credit where credit's due for those references and resources. Uh, so here you can see um, the link to where that free strategy ebook is, um, as well as the edumentality.com website uh, where uh, all of those strategies are located as well. And then finally, thank you uh, for attending. Thank you for all that you do for uh, students um, and all that you do for North Carolina.